Okay, um, the lecture uh, today is going to be from uh, chapter seven. Uh, Kimmel chapter seven is uh, talking about uh, internal control and cash management. Um, let me uh, share my screen. We can pull up the PowerPoint presentation and uh, we'll give it a shot. Okay, uh, chapter seven, uh, fraud internal control in cash. I mean, as you can well imagine, cash is very liquid and cash in its many different forms is uh, suspect to being stolen um, by disgruntled employees and we need to protect it. So we're gonna spend some time at the beginning of this lecture to talk about fraud and internal control. Here are four major learning objectives that we're gonna cover. Uh, define fraud and the principles of internal control. Apply internal control principles to cash. Identify the control features of a bank account and explain the reporting of cash and the basic principles of cash management. So learning objective one, define fraud and the principles of internal control. So what is fraud? Um, may have, many of you have seen it before, it's dishonesty. Um, dishonesty, unfortunately, is rampant in our society, whether it's cheating on an exam or stealing money from a business. Uh, what we have seen, I've attended some seminars where there was a presentation that indicated that 75% of high school students have cheated on tests or exams or homework. And unfortunately, that's a trend that continues through college, mostly because they've never been caught and the students feel as if they can get away with it. So what happens is they start cheating, let's call it academic dishonesty, academic larceny. In high school, they don't get caught, they continue cheating, they go to college, they cheat some more. Again, academic larceny, violations of academic integrity. And they may or may not get caught. This past semester, I caught seven students cheating on my final exam and, and as many of you know those violations are required to be reported to the dean of students and in addition i have policies um, my policy used to be and is currently right now you get a zero on the test that you are have been caught or have been suspected of cheating on that policy beginning in the fall of 2020 is going to change that policy is if I catch you or suspect you of cheating, violating the college's policy on academic integrity, those students will receive an F for the semester. The point is that once individuals begin with academic dishonesty, it continues on through college and may continue to graduate school. But the impact really comes in the business world because people who have committed academic larceny go to work for companies and they're gonna continue. They're gonna cheat at work. Now that cheating can come in many different forms. Falsifying information to their advantage or simply stealing something that doesn't belong to them. So fraud is a dishonest act by an employee that results in personal benefit to the employee at the cost of the employer. That is a very broad statement. If you think about it, it captures a great deal of information. A dishonest act, and many of us know what that is, by an employee that results in a personal benefit at the cost of the employer. We talk about the fraud triangle, why fraud occurs, because there are three important things that go on. There is the opportunity to steal. An employee sees the opportunity to take something. That employee feels financial pressure. 
Maybe they're spending more money than they can afford. You know, they, they only take home, maybe they take home $500 a week, but they're spending $600 a week. They're spending more than they have. So they need money. They're not able to pay their bills. So they feel financial pressure. And then the third component of the fraud triangle is rationalization. Somehow they come up with a rationale, says, well, I won't get caught. Oh, my company makes so much money. They're so rich. They can afford it. They won't miss the money. My employee, my employer doesn't pay me enough. I'm underpaid, so I'm going to take something from them. So they come up with a rationalization. Sarbanes-Oxley uh, Sarbanes Act applies to publicly traded U.S. companies. It requires them to maintain a system of internal control. We're going to talk about internal control in a few minutes, but internal control is designed in such a way to mitigate, to reduce the possibility of fraud, of larceny. It's not going to eliminate it. It's going to try to reduce it. Corporate executives and boards of directors must ensure that these controls are reliable and effective. Why? Because they're protecting the company. They're protecting the stockholders' interest. The stockholders own the company, not the employees, not the managers. It's owned by the stockholders who are not in the business. They're stockholders. They have other jobs, and they've simply invested in that company. They rely on somebody to protect their interests. Sarbanes-Oxley is a process where a system of internal control is put in place to protect those interests. Independent outside auditors, CPAs, must attest to the adequacy of the internal control system. So they're not only rendering an opinion as to the reasonableness or fairness of the financial statements, they have to evaluate the company's system of internal control and render an opinion on that as to whether it's adequate to protect the interests of the stockholders. Purposes of internal control, to safeguard assets, cash, laptops, computers, inventory, to enhance the accuracy and reliability of the accounting records, to increase efficiency of operations and to ensure compliance with laws and regulations. Question, internal control is used in a business to enhance the accuracy and reliability of its accounting records and to not prevent fraud, it can't prevent it, it can reduce the possibilities, produce correct financial statements. No, it's not gonna produce correct Financial statements, the goal is to have fair and reasonable. Correct means 100% correct. Very, very difficult. Deter employee dishonesty. No, it's really designed to safeguard the company's assets. Five primary components of internal control. There's a control environment, a risk assessment, control activities, information and communication, and monitoring. So let's look at some of the principles of internal control. Establishment of responsibility. Control is most effective when only one person is responsible for a given task. This way we know who's responsible for that activity. I'm reluctant to say whose fault is it if there's a problem, but that's essentially what it comes to. If there is a problem, if there is an error, we know who to go to who is responsible for it. Establishing responsibility often requires limiting access only to authorized personnel and then identifying those personnel. Segregation of duties. Different individuals should be responsible for related activities. Responsibility for record keeping for an asset should be separate from the physical custody of that asset. For example, employee A, employee A maintains cash balances per the books. Whereas another person, the cashier maintains custody of the cash on hand. So one employee records the journal entries, another employee collects the cash. Principles of internal control activities, documentation procedures. Companies should use pre-numbered documents and all documents should be accounted for, whether they are sales receipts, purchase orders, or 
checks. They should be pre-numbered and accounted for. Employees should promptly forward source documents for accounting entries to the accounting department. Principles of internal control activities, physical controls, safes, vaults, safe deposit boxes, locks, computer facilities with pass key access, alarms, television monitors, and time clocks. Many of you have seen these kinds of physical controls. Principle, independent internal verifications, records periodically verified by an employee who is independent. So transactions should be able to be verified. Discrepancies, differences between what should have happened and what actually happened must be reported to management. So we have the example here again, where we have employee A who is responsible for maintaining the books for cash, another employee who's responsible for handling the cash. And then we have another person who independently monitors it and can verify what happened. In essence, that the cash that was collected was actually recorded. So if they collected $1,000 in cash on Monday, that $1,000 should be recorded in the accounting records, should be verified by an independent person. Human resource controls, bond employees who handle cash. What's a bond? They get insurance. They pay an insurance policy for an employee who handles cash in the event something happens. And rotate employees' duties and require vacations. So one employee doesn't do that same task all the time. Conduct background checks. If somebody is handling cash responsible for significant assets, you at least want to make sure that that employee he doesn't have a record of larceny. Review question. The principles of internal control do not include. It includes establishment of responsibility. It includes documentation procedures. And it includes independent verification. It does not include management responsibility data analytics and internal control, different aspects of journal entries can be monitored continuously. So what we are talking about here is designing a computer system where certain, certain triggers would occur, certain announcements would occur in the event of certain types of transactions. So different aspects of journal entries can be monitored continuously. Large dollar amounts in risky areas can be flagged and investigated quickly. Recipients of cash been easily screened to ensure that payments only go to authorized individuals and vendors. Sophisticated models can be used to continually estimate critical measures. There are some limitations on internal control, mostly the cost benefit relationship. We don't want the cost to be so high that it exceeds any benefits that we have. Don't want to be hiring too many employees. There's also a human element that goes on. Any internal control system can be circumvented if employees work together in a fraudulent manner. Even though you might have a segregation of duties, couple of employees may decide to work together to steal money from the company and you can't can't always control that size of the businesses it's very difficult for a small business to have a segregation of duties they can only afford to have so many employees identify which control activities some of the things we just looked at is violated each of the following situations. The person with primary responsibility for reconciling the bank account and making all bank deposits as also the company's accountant violates the segregation of duties. They should be separate activities. Handling of cash should be different from the person who reconciles it. Wellstone Company's treasurer received an award for distinguished service because he had not taken a vacation in 30 years. Need to have a vacation. That's a human resource control. In order to save money on order slips and to reduce time spent keeping track of order slips, a local bar restaurant does not buy pre-numbered ordering slips. 
It's a documentation procedure. We need to be able to account for all the documents. If they are pre-numbered, we can account for all of them. If there's a missing number, we ask, where is it? There's an out, if there's a missing check, where is it? Ideally, if it's voided, you save the voided check so you have a number sequence. Applying internal controls to cash. Again, cash is the most liquid item, the item that is most easily stolen. Cash receipt controls, establishment of responsibility. Only designated personnel are authorized to handle cash, the physical control from cash. And then there's a documentation procedure. Use remittance advice, mail receipts, cash register tapes, or computer records in deposit slips. So one person handles the cash. Another person records the transaction, segregation of duties. Over-the-counter receipts. You've seen the situation. You go to the store, you pay cash for something. Segregation of record keeping from physical control is an important internal control. So you can see here, we have an example. The clerk receives the cash. She sends cash and count to the cashier. The cashier counts the cash and prepares a deposit slip, delivers the cash and the deposit slip to the bank. And the accounting department records the cash transaction. Mail receipts should be opened by two people, a, listed, a list prepared and each check endorsed for deposit only. Each mail clerk signs the list to establish responsibility for the data. Original copy of the list along with the checks is sent to the cashier's department. Copy of the list is sent to the accounting department for the record keeping. Notice that last item, copy of the list to the accounting department. The accounting department does not get the cash. The accounting department gets a piece of paper that shows the amount of the cash. Person who records it is not the same person who handles the cash. Question, permitting only designated personnel such as cashiers to handle cash receipts is an application of the principle of what? Establishment of responsibility. Generally, internal control over cash disbursements is more effective when companies pay by check or electronic funds rather than cash. I have a voucher system, and we're going to talk briefly about petty cash fund. Cash disbursement controls, establishment of responsibility. Only designated personnel are authorized to sign checks. Segregation of duties, different individuals approve and make payments. Check signers do not record disbursements. Documentation, use pre-numbered checks and account for them in sequence. Each check must have an approved invoice, require employees to use corporate credit cards for reimbursable expenses, stamp invoices paid. So there's controls. The person writing the checks does not record the checks. Another question. The use of pre-numbered checks in dispersing cash is an application of the principle of documentation procedures. The voucher system, a network of approvals by authorized individuals acting independently to ensure all disbursements by check are proper. A voucher is an authorization form prepared for each expenditure in a voucher system. The person who writes the checks doesn't approve the expenditure. Cortez is concerned about the control over cash receipts in his fast food restaurants, Big Cheese. The restaurant has two cash registers. At no time do more than two employees take customer orders and enter sales. Work shifts for employees range from four to eight hours. Cortez asks your help in installing a good system of internal control over cash receipts. Here's our solution. A separate cash register drawer should be assigned to each employee at the start of each shift with register totals, right? Establish responsibility. Each employee should have access to only the assigned register 
to enter all sales. Again, establish responsibility. Each customer should be given a receipt, documentation. At the end of the shift, the employee should do a cash count. A separate employee should compare cash count with the register tape to be sure they agree. Okay, verification. Cortez should install an automated point of sale system that would enable the company to compare orders entered in the register to orders processed by the kitchen. Again, verification. Let's identify the control features of a bank account. Use of a, use of a bank contributes significantly to good internal control over cash, minimizes the amount of currency on hand, right? Don't want to be have a big bag of cash that you receive cash in and pay bills out. No, the bank account itself provides good internal control. Creates a double record of bank transactions. Bank records, bank records create an independent record of which to agree the company's books with the bank record. So there's gonna be a comparison between what is recorded in the company's accounting system and recorded in the bank. We're gonna see this when we look at the bank reconciliation. Essentially, the bank statement is a copy of the bank's records sent to the customer or made available online for review. Electronic funds mm -hmm. transfer, disbursement systems that use wire, telephone, or computers to transfer cash from one location to another. Use is quite common, normally result in better internal control since no cash or checks are handled by company employees. This is what a bank statement looks like. And we're gonna work with this a little bit. Each month the company receives from the bank a bank statement showing its bank transactions. So you can see here a bank statement. The name of the bank is National Bank and Trust. The company name is Lard Company. This is for the month ended April 30th, 2022. And what you look at here is you can see all the checks that were processed, that cleared through the bank. You can see all the deposits that the company made that were recorded in the bank, and they have a running balance. Bank statements show the following, checks paid and other debits that reduce the balance, debit card transactions, electronic funds transfer, shows deposits, direct deposits, automated teller machine and electronic funds transfer. So there's a bunch of transactions here. Bank statements also show some debit memorandum. So debits in the bank statement are reductions of the balance. Credits are increases. So some of the debits that go through the bank account are bank service charges, NSF checks, insufficient funds, credit memorandum, which we collection of notes receivable or interest earned. Another question, the control features of a bank account do not include, let's look at B, minimizing the amount of cash that must be kept on hand, that, that, that's true. Providing a double record of all bank transactions, that's also true. Safeguarding cash by using the bank as a depository, that's also true, but let's look at A, having bank auditors verify the correctness of the bank balance per books, per books, no, that, Bank auditors have nothing to do with the per books balance. So the answer is A. Reconciling the bank account. And we're gonna spend some time on this. Reconcile the balance per books, the accounting system, the balance in the cash T account, right? And the bank and the balance per the bank, which comes from the bank statement. We're going to reconcile that to a correct or true balance. There's going to be some reconciling items due to time lags, deposits in transit. A deposit in transit is where the deposit is recorded on the books of a company, but it didn't make it to the bank in time, so it's not on the bank statement, a deposit in transit. Outstanding checks. Checks that are written by the company mailed to the vendor, but haven't been presented at the bank yet, so those are outstanding. There might be some bank memorandum, bank service charges that are recorded by the bank, 
but not recorded in the general ledger system yet. There might be some errors in the accounting records. Here's our reconciliation procedures. We're going to have two columns here, essentially. We're going to start on the left-hand side with the balance per the bank. And we're going to have some reconciling items. You're always going to add deposits in transit. You're always going to subtract outstanding checks. And then there might be plus or minus for bank errors arriving at a corrected cash balance. On the right-hand side, we're gonna start with the balance on the books, the balance in the T account for cash. We're gonna make some adjustments. There might be some collections that were recorded by the bank, but not recorded by the company. There might be some bounce checks. So customers may have given us a check the check balance for non-sufficient funds, we need to subtract that. We need to subtract service charges. And there again may be some company errors. Again, arriving at the correct cash balance. Here's an illustration. The bank statement for large company shows a balance per the bank of 15,000 on April 30th on this date. The balance of cash per the books is 11,700. So you've got a bank balance and you've got a book balance. LAR determines the following reconciling items, deposits in transit, outstanding checks, other deposits, unrecorded electronic receipt from a customer. Unrecorded means that they didn't record it on the books, but it was recorded by the bank. Other payments, unrecorded charges, determined from the bank statements at NSF, bounce check. Credit card fees, again, not recorded on the books, but recorded by the bank. Bank service charges, recorded by the bank, not recorded on the books. And then there was an error here. Check number 443 was correctly written by Lard for 1226 and was correctly paid by the bank on April 12, 1226. However, it was recorded as 1262 on the Lard's books. So they took too much out, we gotta put it back. Here's my reconciliation. So the very top was starting with cash balance per the bank statement. That's from the bank. We're gonna always add deposits and transit. And we're gonna subtract those checks that were written by the company, but which have not cleared the bank yet. And there are three of them. We have an adjusted balance in cash of 12,204. The next part, we're going to start with the balance in the company's account, the T account for cash, 11709 going to add the 1035 because that was collected by the bank but not recorded on the books. There was an error in check number 443. We're going to add $36 back because they took out too much cash. There was an NSF check. We recorded the receipt of 425 in our books, but it bounced. We have to subtract it from cash. Credit card fees and bank service charges also were taken out. So here's the key. Journal entries are required for everything on the lower half of this. So all of the items, that are listed on the book side of the reconciliation require you to prepare journal entries to adjust the balance in the cash account on the books. Let's take a look. Entries resulting from the bank reconciliation. Collection of the electronic funds transfer for a payment of a bank of account by a customer. Increase cash increase account, uh, decrease accounts receivable. Let's go back and look at the reconciliation. See, it says add electronic funds transfer. They collected funds. The bank collected funds that the company was not aware of. So we need to record that. Increase cash, decrease the accounts receivable. There was an error. 
The cash disbursement journal shows that check number 443 was a payment on account to Andrea Company supplier. The correcting entry is as follows. So remember, they reduced cash by too much. They need to put the cash back in. They increase cash, and decrease, in, increase the payable because they decreased the payable by too much. The NSF check. Again, this was, as indicated earlier, NSF check becomes an accounts receivable to the depositor. So what happened? One of Lard's customers gave them a check for $425.60. Lard recorded the cash, debit cash, credit accounts receivable when they received it. But the check bounced. So we have to reduce cash and increase the accounts receivable again. They still owe us the money. So you increase the receivable, you decrease cash. Bank charges. Again, these are charges that showed up on the bank statement that have not yet been recorded on the books of the company. We debit the expense for the bank charges, increase the expense, reduce cash. So this is what my T account looks like. Again, remember, the journal entries come from the book side of the reconciliation only. Beginning balance in cash on April 30th was 11709 There are the journal entries that you just made. The balance, the correct balance in cash is 12204 Let's go back to the reconciliation and take a look at that. 12204 See the balance on the very bottom of the sheet? Adjusted cash balance per books, 12,204.85. Your journal entries got you there. Let's go back to that T account. Here's the T account, 12,204.85. Reconciliation question. The reconciling item in a bank statement that will result in adjusting entry by the depositor is bank service charges, all the others do not. They're on the bank side of the reconciliation only. Only on the book side of the reconciliation are you making journal entries. Sally Kist, owner of Linen Kist Fabrics, asks you to explain how she should treat the following reconciling items when reconciling the company's bank account. One, a debit memorandum. Two, a credit memorandum. Three, an outstanding check for a deposit in transit, NSF check deduct from the balance per books. Electronic transfer, add to balance per books. Three, outstanding checks, deduct from the balance per bank. Deposit and transit, add to the balance per bank. Explain the reporting of cash and the basic principles of cash management. Cash, cash on the balance sheet consists of coins, currency, checks, money orders, and money on hand or deposit in the bank. The balance sheet reports amount of cash available at a given point in time, listed first in the current assets section. Why? Because the assets in the balance sheet are listed in the order of liquidity. Cash is the most liquid. Statement of cash flows, which we're not going to cover in this semester, shows sources and uses of cash during the period. What are cash equivalents? It's not cash, but it's a cash equivalent. Short-term, highly liquid investments that are both readily convertible to known amounts of cash and so near their maturity that their market value is relatively insensitive to changes in interest rates. Cash equivalents, cash that is not available for general use but it's equivalent to cash. You'll see more of that when you get to the statement of cash flows. Reporting cash on the balance sheet. Cash and cash equivalents, short-term investments, restricted cash. Again, in the order of liquidity. Question, which of the following statements correctly describes the reporting of cash? Cash cannot be combined with cash equivalents. False. Restricted cash funds may be combined with cash. Yes. Cash is listed first in the current asset section. Yes, restricted cash funds cannot be reported as a current asset. Which of the following is correct? Cash is listed. Cash, can, cash is listed first. It's always first. 
indicate whether each of the following statements is true or false. Cash and cash equivalents are comprised of coins, currency, money orders, and NSF checks. False, it does not include NSF checks. Restricted cash is classified as either a current asset or a non-current asset, depending on the circumstances. True. A company may have a negative balance in its bank account. In this case, it should offset this negative balance against cash and cash equivalents on the balance sheet. False, if it has a negative balance, this be an account's payable. Because cash and cash equivalents often include short-term investments, accounts receivable should be reported as the first item of the balance sheet. False, cash and cash equivalents is always the first one. So we've seen this cycle before, the operating cycle of a merchandising company. They have cash, they buy inventory with it, they sell that inventory, that inventory becomes a receivable, they receive the cash and they start all over again. Cash management, the idea of a cash management system is to increase the speed of receivable collection, keep inventory low, again, to preserve cash, monitor the payment of liabilities, again, to maximize the amount of cash being held, plan the timing of major expenditures, and invest idle cash. Again, the goal is to preserve as much cash as possible. Cash budgeting, and again, you'll see cash budgeting if you go on to Accounting 204 or the MBA program, where you take a course similar to managerial accounting. Cash budgeting shows anticipated cash flows, usually over a one or two year period. Cash receipts, cash disbursements, and financing activities. This enables a company to plan ahead to cover possible shortages. So again, planning ahead, looking forward, projecting to see if they have enough cash when they need it. So here's a basic budget where Hayes Company has a cash budget. And again, they're trying to determine if they have enough cash when they need it. The basic structure, you have a beginning cash balance. You're gonna add cash collections, subtract cash disbursements, determine if you have an excess or a deficient cash balance, and borrow money if you need it. Here's an example. Marsh and Company Management wants to maintain a minimum monthly cash balance of $15,000. They never want to go below that. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. At the beginning of March, the cash balance is $16,500. Expected receipts, $210. Disbursements 220. How much cash, if any, must Martian borrow to maintain the desired minimum balance? So this is a great little worksheet here because it gives you the basic structure for a cash budget. Beginning cash balance 16.5. Their estimated collections, they're going to add that of 210. Cash available, 226.5. They estimate disbursements of 220. They have an estimated excess of available cash, $6,500, but they wanna maintain a cash balance of $15,000. So they have to borrow $8,500. That's a great format to remember. Explain the operation of petty cash. What is petty cash? Petty cash is somebody in the office has a drawer full of cash that they're gonna to use to pay small expenses. Operation of a petty cash fund used to pay small amounts involves establishing the fund, making payments for the fund, and replenishing the fund on a regular basis. If a large company decides to establish a hundred dollar fund on March, the entry is so. This is the entry to initially establish the fund debit petty cash, credit the regular cash account. Custodian has the authority to make payments from the fund. Size of expenditures is limited by management. There's only, you're talking about expenditures of 10 bucks, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, very small items. Use of fund is limited to certain types of transactions. Payments are documented on a pre-numbered receipt. Again, we wanna document, we wanna keep track of these expenses going forward. Signatures of both the custodian and the individual receiving payment are required on these pre-numbered receipts. 
Supporting documents should be attached. You're working late in the office. You want to order a pizza. The pizza guy comes by, 20 bucks, you give him $20 cash, you have a receipt, paid cash, petty cash disbursement. Making payments from petty cash. Custodian keeps receipts in the petty cash box until the fund is replenished. The, this is the key right here. The sum of the receipts and money in the fund should always equal the established totals at the time. So at any point in time, if the fund was set up for $100, the combination of the receipts and the cash should always equal $100. That combination, receipts and cash, should always equal the amount that the fund was initially established for. Here's an example. On March 15th, the petty cash custodian requests a check for $87. The fund contains $13 in cash and receipts, postage 44, freight out 38, and miscellaneous expenses of five. We want to replenish the fund. You need to record a journal entry. You need to record those expenses and reestablish the fund. Again, the combination of receipts and cash always equals that $100. Again, they've got receipts of $87 and cash, petty cash of 13, it equals. What if it doesn't equal? Assume in the preceding example that the custodian had only $12 in cash in the fund plus receipts at, as listed. The request for the reimbursement would therefore be $88, right? Because you need to have $100. They only had 12 in cash. They need a receipt of $88. See that account? Cash over or short. There's gonna be errors, there's gonna be mistakes. That cash over or short should never be a big number, always very, very small. There you go. So those are the things that you need to remember from this chapter. Chapter seven, fraud, internal control, and cash. Thank you.